let's talk about how the payments industry has traveled a long way very quickly over the last 10 years, powered by a steady stream of innovations that have changed how we transact, what we use to transact with, and how to tap into a wider stream of financial services offerings. Now, those advances have made payments one of the hottest and most dynamic sectors in the world. But Boston Consulting Group's Global Payments Report 2023 warns that the operating environment is likely to become much more challenging in the near future. To discuss this in more detail, we're joined by the co-authors of the report, uh, Tisbert Kremers, Managing Director and Senior Partner at BCG, and Indapreet Batra, Managing Director and Senior Partner at BCG. Gentlemen, welcome to Cybus TV. Uh, it's great to have you. I hope you're having a fruitful uh, couple of days here in Toronto so far. I'm going to start with Tisbert over here. Your report contains some startling news uh, for the first time in years growth in global payments revenues is slowing uh, slowly falling from 8.3 percent over the last five years to 6.2 percent over the next five what's going on if you can tell us is this the the moment of truth uh, for your report that your report title refers to Oh, well, it is um, not only because sort of we suddenly see a slowdown from sort of like a, a high uh, eight to ten percent growth to sort of like five to seven. So obviously that's a market change, but that's obviously driven also by all the volatility that happens globally, um, and not not different than many other industries. What what's striking in the in the payment space is that at the same time we see changes in the competitive landscape as well as in the regulatory landscape, as well as in technology. And um, those three additional trends also make up that um, the banks and the fintechs that operate in this space have to reinvent themselves and their, uh, their models. Uh, and that means big uh, tech changes, big operating model changes that they actually have to, um, to get prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to let you chime in in just a moment, Indra Pete, but I do have a second question for you, Tisbert, because payment companies like everyone else are facing continued macroeconomic uncertainty. But uh, while secular factors are, are, are making the operative environment more challenging, your report seems to point to something uh, deeper, that the industry itself is being reshaped. So can you talk about some of the disruptors at play here? Yeah, so, so some of the things that we're seeing is sort of the increased importance of compliance and some of the fintechs sort of are facing that right now they've had uh, a long a long trajectory of growth but now sort of they're coming into a space where they're actually sort of like banks uh, also facing sort of that they deal need to deal with the compliance and need to actually catch up so that's that's one of the determining factors on the other side you see that sort of with all this tech change uh, regulatory change there's also really uh, this big need for tech modernization uh, to deal with real-time payments which means a massive change from batch-based uh, processing to, to actually doing everything real time. And it's a change both for the banks as well as for customers. So corporate customers are also used to batch-based uh, uh, settlements and, and have to change their operating models to deal with that as well if they want to really take advantage of this. So um, it's, it's opportunity, but it's also sort of changes and therefore opportunities to outcompete and to redefine the competitive landscape. If you can jump in here, one of the most striking things from the report is how much valuations have fallen over the last couple of years. TSR is down by 20% uh, for many of the largest payments businesses uh, since 2021. And sectors such as acquiring and payments processing have been uh, seen shareholder returns plummet by as much as 40%. Uh, what's driving this devaluation we're seeing at the moment? What can payments companies do to reverse this slide? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think if you start by just thinking about what drives TSR in payments, it's revenue growth, which is about 50 to 60% of total returns, and then EBITDA or profit margins, which is about another 30%. So revenue growth is the biggest driver of TSR. And what we've seen happen since 2020 is a bit of normalization in growth expectations. So we had a lot of companies that grew during COVID off the back of e-commerce, off the back of you know, the transition to digital payments, and the expectations were that that growth would continue, uh, which obviously hasn't happened. It hasn't turned out like that. E-commerce as a percentage of retail sales, for example, has actually declined in the US over the last 12 months. So a big part of that 20% is just normalization of growth expectations. When you then look at the acquirers and processors who have seen a much more significant decline, 
it's been, there's two main reasons that drive that. One is the fact that, yes, we will still see growth at even at six or 7%, but how much of that growth is going to be captured by them versus software companies who are increasingly sitting between them and their customers? And the second, uh, the second question that investors are raising is, will you be able to maintain these margins given the investments you have to make in product and innovation? And those are the two main reasons why we've seen um, acquirers and processors as a segment lag the overall industry. Um, and this is the moment of truth, or this is why we are saying it's the moment of truth because if you're an investor, you're essentially asking, you know, what is it that, like this is the moment of, this is a moment of strategy for these companies, right? If you are talking to your investors, your investors are looking for you to tell them, okay, what is your differentiator? What is your moat? In an industry that used to grow at 8%, you were growing at 8%, um, and now we have an expectation that you're gonna to continue to grow at 8%. But if the industry declines to 6% growth, you still have to, grow at 8% because that's what your investors expect. And so questions around differentiation, questions around your ability to uh, stay competitive are becoming a lot more important, which is why to the comp point that Tysbert was making, it's very, very important for all payments companies to look at, okay, what really defines us? You know, and why are we different? And how are we going to outcompete uh, other players in this space? Mm, and, and you talk with senior payment leaders every day. So what are the, the near term and the long term actions that uh, you think most companies should have high up, high up on their agendas? Yeah. So I think the strategy question is number one, as I, as I mentioned. There are three other topics that, that frequently bubble up to the, to, into these conversations. Number one is technology. Uh, because at the end of the day, payments companies are technology companies but they haven't necessarily grown and operated that way. So there is a big focus on how do we modernize our technology? How do we actually become a, a technology company? So start to operate like one, have products that are out there in the market, put out very frequently. The second topic that's, that's top of mind for a lot of uh, leaders in payments companies is partnerships and M&A. Um, We've seen a lot of growth in the industry happen on the back of mega deals. You would buy someone like you, you would consolidate, and you would end up becoming more efficient and also gaining more, uh, a little bit more growth. Yeah. That stage is almost over, we would say, because there are no more mega deals to be had. So now the focus has shifted on what should my, how should my corporate development agenda help me to differentiate? So where can I strike a partnership to bring a new product? What can I buy so I have a new capability? So that's number two. And the third one is risk and compliance, which in generally, so that's always been a top priority for banks, but we are increasingly seeing that become part of the, 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 the CEO agenda, even for non-banks, because we, we're seeing a lot of pressure from regulators um, around, not just around new rules, we are seeing new rules being proposed in multiple jurisdictions, but also around enforcement, that they want to make sure that you know, companies are following the rules and there's a, there's a level playing field. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that regulators have been really stepping up their involvement in the payment space at the moment, not only proposing new rules, but of course stepping up this uh, enforcement. I thought it was particularly interesting to learn that authorities have begun to collaborate across jurisdictions, especially around Europe. Uh, what are the implications here, do you think, in the payments uh, for payments leaders? Uh, and are the banks, uh, these, these developments, something that uh, primarily affect banks, do you think? Uh, or do non-banks also need to be paying attention to what's going on? Yeah, so I think the, the, the main implication here is to be prepared, right? So, so you have a whole bunch of rules that are being proposed across jurisdictions. For example, in the US, we have proposed rules around interchange, we have proposed rules around late fees and credit cards. There has to be a very, very robust process by which you as a leader and you as a firm need to know how they can impact your business. A second implication is that um, you need to embrace risk as a part of your business as usual. Uh, particularly on the non-bank side. Banks are more advanced on this one, but non-banks typically treat risk as a function, that you know you are here to help us take risk, or you are help, here to help us manage risk. Whereas what really needs to happen is for the business itself to say, I am in the business of taking risk, and how do I get better at it? And that's a big change in culture, that's a big change in new capabilities that you, that you, need, to be, that you need to be building. Mm -hmm. And it's, more, it's a stronger imperative for non-banks given they are further behind banks.
Mm. Uh, uh, Tisper, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Let's talk about a hot topic, uh, generative AI. It's everywhere, uh, all over the business press. It's popping up uh, in quarterly earnings calls. It, it's creating an investor frenzy as well. So uh, how will it play a role in payments and where are we likely to see it driving impact and how soon? Well, so we believe it will drive impact. And if you think about uh, what payments really is, it's, it's a phenomenal amount of transactions and data that's, that's being created. But there's also sort of in the corporate space, things like invoices and letters of credit. So there's a lot of sort of paper-based, sometimes quite unstructured uh, pieces of data that you can actually uh, absorb and create sort of uh, predictions or new, new, uh, new advice or solutions with. And, and that creates an opportunity for, uh, for uh, uh, a competitive advantage as well. And so um, if, if we think about it, there's probably uh, three, four buckets that you can, can see applications in. One is in, in advancing client service, um, uh, taking all that unstructured data and then uh, coming up with sort of qu uh, answers to queries of customers and, and advanced reconciliation uh, for customers. A second one is around software coding. I think everybody is busy with software coding and that's already sort of in practice today as a use case. Obviously within the uh, payments and transaction space that's also something you can think about. And then a third one uh, is more around uh, sort of operational improvements um, uh, and and one one area maybe non-financial risk or compliance actually and uh, we just talked about it I mean there's also lots of data sort of hidden in documentation that you can I mean you can uh, analyze it which Gen AI is quite good at and you can generate reports with it which which Gen AI is quite good at and then there's a bunch of transversal uh, probably use cases in finance uh, uh, and, and other disciplines. Um, but so I, I think the, the opportunities are actually massive. Um, it will take time though before we get to, uh, to scale on it because we also need to think about sort of how do we use it responsibly and, and uh, have this risk, uh, uh, risk mentality also to Gen AI. So important to start mm. to explore the use cases. And, and then over time scale it and, and at the same time manage this, uh, this responsible um, uh, AI perspective. Mm. Staying on the subject of, of tech for a moment, your report uh, mentions how we're in the, in the clutch of a, of a massive tech modernization effort which is underway, uh, affecting not only the types of payments methods used but the entire infrastructure underpin underpinning uh, the payments industry. Uh, can you can you describe to us some of the the changes some of the shifts that you're you're seeing at the moment yeah no, absolutely so what we see is actually the changes happening on two sides so on the sort of the, uh, we, we described in the beginning real-time payments and new standards iso 2022 that are coming into play which sort of drive this change from batch-based processing and settlement into uh, into real time. So the capabilities that we need to have for interfaces as well as for processing just change massively. On the other side, on the sort of client interface uh, layer, there is also uh, big changes because we are starting to participate more into ecosystem solutions, platform solutions. Um, and, and the capabilities you need to have to unlock data as well as to uh, provide APIs that are easy to integrate with for some of these platform providers, um, uh, sort of they, they need to be standard. And as a bank, you need to compete to be the easiest to integrate with uh, as well. And so that's a, obviously also a technology capability that you need to develop. And whereas that played previously mostly in the consumer uh, B2C segment is now also really picking up in, into the B2B segment. So for instance, here in the US, you have, a, 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 you have fintechs that are specializing in industry vertical solutions where banks then can participate in that. So if they can partner successfully with these fintechs, they, they can take advantage of them. Uh, so that partnership skill and the technical capability to partner or the technological capability to partner becomes then a competitive advantage. So both sides require change. So uh, to execute well on that and to make the right choices, not try to do everything at the same time, is going to be a key, uh, key differentiator. It fits well in with the, the collaborative uh, collaboration in a fragmented world, which is obviously the big theme uh, of this year's Cyrus, doesn't it? Absolutely. It a, an interesting report, an important one that I'm sure will spark lots of conversation about the future of the industry. Tisbert, Tisbert Creamer is Managing Dir Director and P Senior Partner at BCG. Indrapeet Batra, Managing Director and Senior Partner at BCG. Thanks to you both for stopping by here at Cybos TV. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chance.